Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining me for Let's Chat. My name is Shayla Reeves, and today we have two amazing women that are going to be joining us tonight to talk about the topic of finding yourself alone. Sometimes in life, you may go through something traumatic or something difficult, and the people that you think and hope will be there for you they're not able to be there for you in the way that you need them. Maybe you've dealt with something that's so heavy that you seem a little different to them. Maybe they're moving away from you and you're not only navigating the trauma that you're working through, but you're also navigating the changes in those relationships you always hoped would be there. So to join us for this conversation today, we have, I'll start with Ellen Lagoon Waters. Ellen is a creative writer. I love that because I'm a creative writer too. And she's also a speaker and a survivor of a traumatic brain injury. I had a chance to meet Ellen. Uh, it was just a few weeks ago, actually, at an event, a Birdies for Brains event. And sometimes you just meet people and you say, I don't know what it is, but I feel like people really need to hear her story. She's been sharing her story uh, all over the place, but I'm excited to have her join us today in this conversation and share her story with all of you. Also joining us today, we have Dr. Zakia Robbins-McNeil. Joining us again, she's a therapist, a professor, an author, and she is just someone who I've invited on several times to provide some insights and perspective and some words to push you forward wherever you are in your life as well. So I want to go ahead and start with Ellen. Ellen, thanks so much for joining us. Um, Absolutely. Yes, your story really touched me, and it, and it all started back in May 31st of 2002 when you and your sister were in a car accident. Can you tell us about that? Uh, 2001, actually. 2001, okay. Yep. Yeah, I just passed my 19-year anniversary. Wow. <laughs> yes. Uh, but no, my sister and I were on our way to school, and it was just a normal day. I was talking her ear off, you know, just like normal little sister talking her big sister's ear off. I was so excited because I had a golf date after school that day with a cute sophomore boy, but I never got to go on that golf date. <laughs> uh, we, sorry, go ahead. And what, what happened uh, that kept you from going on that date? Uh, well, from what I've been told, I personally, I don't understand. I don't remember the day at all. I remember the day before the accident, making the golf date with the, cute boy in the library. And I remember waking up over a month later in rehab and wondering, like seeing my uncle from Arizona at the bottom of my bed, wondering how the heck did my parents get me to Arizona overnight without me knowing it? I had no idea what was going on. Um, but from what I've been told, um, my sister and I were on our way to school and my dad had given me a big bag of Skittles because those were my favorite. And my sister and I both had Skittles in our hands. And I rolled up the bag and for some reason unbuckled my seatbelt and leaned forward into the glove box to put the bag in there. And what happened was from what I've been told, um, when I was leaning forward in the glove box, I looked at my sister who was driving and asked her some kind of a question and she still refuses to tell me what that question was but whatever it was made her turn her head towards me to answer me right where we're supposed to go around the turn so instead of going around that turn we crossed the center line and hit the guy going the other way on um yeah. And when when that happened, you said you were severely injured by the airbag and airlifted to Gillette Children's Hospital in St. Paul, where they placed you in a medically induced coma for about a month, right? Correct. Yes. And then at that time, um, you were diagnosed as having a severe traumatic brain injury. Um, and after awaking from that coma, you were forced to relearn absolutely everything. Yeah. Do you remember going through that process and, and internally, what were you feeling uh, in that process? I remember parts. Okay. What keep parts in mind, do you remember? Keep in mind memories. Memory is a big issue with brain injuries. Um, so I remember some things. I remember that 
my parents would take turns spending the night with me at the hospital and going to my therapies with me. And I remember that, well, one of the things that really touches me so much is that I've only seen my dad cry three times. The first time was when I was in the hospital. I remember I climbed up and down the little flight of therapy stairs for the first time, alternating feet, and then coming back down, alternating feet, instead of going one step at a time. And when I got to the bottom, my dad was sobbing. And looking back, it's a very small accomplishment, but at that point, it was huge for me. And it was like he was watching his little girl grow up all over again. And you literally had to relearn um, walking, talking, climbing stairs, riding, mm -hmm. even dressing yourself. Imagine that embarrassment as a 15 year old girl. <laughs> and in high school, high school can already be tricky enough, but now you're not only navigating high school, you're navigating, relearning all of these things. And then your friendships began to change too, right? Yeah. And I want to start off by saying that I don't hold anything against anybody. I've forgiven everybody. I know people have their reasons and, you know, that's how we deal with life. Um, unfortunately, when I returned to school, one of the biggest issues with me is that um, my maturity levels were very low. It was almost like the bump on my head knocked me to being a five-year-old in a 15-year-old's body. So people just didn't really understand and didn't know how to interact with me anymore. And for you, when I can imagine you were probably just trying to readjust just get back to something that felt normal while you're struggling with the brain injury. Then you're also navigating the challenges of high school, the changes in your friendships. I know that you said um, you had been in all advanced placement classes since middle school. And with this injury, you then were classified as a special education student. So emotionally, the toll that that may have taken on you on top of the injury you're recovering from, on top of the changes in your friendships. Um, can you kind of take us back to emotionally where you, what you remember as far as how you were feeling then? I went through some severe depression. Um, I, I didn't understand why I was being treated the way that I was or being basically being ignored. I mean, I'm from a very small town. Small town mentality is, you know, when things change, you don't try and understand them. You just ignore them. And this actually one of my best friends at the time, when she started ignoring me, my sister, who was a senior, or yeah, she was a senior at this point, and she's this, um, she was the president of student council, so very, very popular. She cornered this friend in the hallway, and she's like, why, why are you ignoring my sister? And she's like, well, I just, when there's something I don't understand, and I just, I don't understand it, I, I just ignore it. And my sister was like, okay, so you're just going to ignore my sister? And she's like, oh, well, yeah, but don't tell him that I don't want to hurt her feelings. And we're like, oh, well, we can kind of figure it out ourselves, you know? Um, and, uh, like why my other best friend at the time that stopped talking to me, her reasoning was a lot easier to understand for me. Her mother was in a car accident almost a year to the day before mine and also suffered traumatic brain injury. So it was very difficult for her to deal with everything at home with her mom recovering and then coming to school where she was kind of supposed to be away from it all and having to go through it again with another person she loved. Um, before we continue with your story, I want to bring in Dr. Z here. There's kind of a lot to unpack there. There's the, the challenges of, of navigating 
the the trauma of the injury that she's been through then there's the challenges of those relationships changing and the people no longer being able to be in her life in the way that she needed them what can you um tell us about that uh, as far as as you know how to navigate that why that happens why do people find themselves responding in that way to someone else's trauma and instead of going to the person and saying hey like you're my friend you've always been my friend you probably need me more now than ever you see them moving away yeah so i'm sorry that that happened to you ellen um you. my heart goes out to you because i can only imagine you know even still what you will deal with for your life you know, you're dealing with that for life, even though it happened at the age of 15. So when you're dealing with not even just traumatic brain injury, when you're dealing with something as traumatic as you have experienced, you never know how people will react. Right. We don't know what their previous experiences were. One of your friends was able to verbalize what happened or the reason why they felt the way they felt. But we don't know what your other friend's upbringing was and why she just needed to just like shut it out. Um, everybody has different. They grow up in different environments. They grow up with different families and have different experiences. That's what shapes and molds the people that they were currently at that time. So we don't know like how her parents raised her. We don't know if she just did not know how to communicate. So shutting down was the easiest for her. It really had nothing to do with you. It was there, it was there, and I'm not even gonna say issue because it's not their issue. It was the way, the best way that they knew how to handle it with the information that they had at the time. So I, I, I love the fact that you said that you don't hold any grudges, you don't feel any animosity towards people. And that's really the best way to operate because you never know you never know what happened to them that forced them to be that way, but that was the, all they knew at that time. And did it take you some time to get to that space where you felt like, Ellen, I'm, I'm not holding anything against them? Um, or, or was that something you came to quickly on? Or, or, or was that just been through the process of healing that you found yourself in that space? Honestly, I think that it probably wasn't until I was in college that I was finally able to forgive, not forget, but forgive. Um, and I think it was through, I went to school for creative writing, my degrees in creative writing. And I think it was through all of the writing that I did. Um, for instance, my, um, fiction class, my final project was turning my story into a fiction story. Um, but then one of the things that really sticks out to me from that and why I feel like writing is really my therapy is I ended up writing a poem in my poetry class about a situation that happened to me when I was in high school the first year I came back so when I was a sophomore. And um, it was about going back to basketball in the winter. And one of my only real lasting injuries that people can notice is I don't have a sense of smell. And by the time we were in the middle of the season, that quote unquote rumor was going around that I didn't have a sense of smell and most people didn't believe it. So, after an away game, the varsity captain had asked me to come and sit with her on the bus on the way home. And at this point, I was already, you know, losing friends. And so, of course, I'm going to jump at the chance to sit with the varsity captain when I was on junior varsity, you know. Uh, well, she proceeded to um, blindfold me with the bandana she used during the game. And with the help of my childhood friend and neighbor, forced me to smell each individual Mr. Sketch marker, you know, those fruity permanent markers, and had the entire bus involved in taunting and laughing at me when I got every single one of them wrong. And 
coaches at the front of the bus did nothing to stop it. I went home that night and wrote a letter of resignation. I told my parents when I came home crying that it was because coach wouldn't give me playing time because he was afraid I would hit my head. I went into the school the next day and turned in those letters to both my coach and that captain that did that to me. And I haven't played competitive basketball since. I never told my parents or my sister about this. And then I wrote a poem about it and made a little chat book of all my poems from the semester and gave them to family and friends for Christmas. Well, my family was not very happy with me when they read that poem. And they were just like, why would you not tell us? And I just, I'm like, well, you know, one of the last things the captain said before I left the bus was, don't you dare tell your sister. And I just, I knew that if I told, my parents would have gone to the superintendent. They would have called my coach. They would have called my um, my neighbor. My sister would have confronted everybody at school and it would have made my life even more miserable than it already was in school because then I'd be a tattletale too. So I kept it inside. I can just feel and hearing you say that just the weight of that experience. And even years later, the, the pain that it's, it carries. It's not often that I can get through that story without crying, honestly. Mm -hmm. And Dr. Z, um, what, what can you offer? Um, Cause it's painful going through any kind of trauma, but then to have, you've got the dynamic of people that you want close to you moving away. Then you've got people that use your trauma for fun or for pleasure. And it's compounding the pain of the person that's already going through the trauma. Um, what can you add for us? Again, I, I can't reiterate, you know, it, how sorry I am. Kids can be so cruel. What you experienced was bullying. And it was totally unfair. It was unfair for you to have to, instead of protecting you, people made fun of and ridiculed you at a time when you actually needed them the most. You know, that's the time when you should have been rallied around. Um, but again, we never know what people's upbringing, you know, you never know what their upbringing is that made them think that that was okay. That made them think that it was appropriate. It's never appropriate or okay to do anything like that. You know, say if that was the, that was your little sister or, you know, I'm sure nobody put themselves in your shoes. Um, I mean, I'm going to apologize for the adults that did not stand up, right? Because the adults should have stood up for you, you know, and you, you didn't feel like you could even say anything, which, you know, sometimes people use that too as a manipulative tactic to kind of, tease and ridicule and, you know, just gain power over somebody. But I am happy that you did take it upon yourself to even, even though you didn't let people know what it was, at least you did get off that team because that's not a place where you needed to be at that time, especially, you know, in your condition and in not being protected by the adults. So I'm going to fault the adults for not protecting <laughs> you in, in that, you know, at a minimum they should have protected you or at least did something about it. So I'm sorry that that happened to you. Um, I'm glad that you're able to talk about it now. Um, and uh, that you're writing for it. Go ahead. Sorry. One of the biggest things I feel that I'm still dealing with, but that I've dealt with a lot then is that people don't take the time to understand what they don't know. Um, for instance, like, because I look exactly the same as I did before my injury. So people look at me and they expect me to be the same as I was before. And then they talked to me and I wasn't. Um, I, in my senior year, so basically backtracking a little bit, I had um, a few goals with my case manager in special education that I wanted to complete before I graduated. I wanted to graduate on time with my class. I wanted to graduate completing all of the same requirements that my class had to complete. And I wanted to graduate with honors 
even if it was lowest honors. So because of the part of my brain that was injured being the part that deals with math and problem solving, um, the school district had to change a business course into a math course so that I could get my last math credit since I had taken all of the low maths already. Um, and then they told me I should take physics instead of chemistry because it would have less math. And um, so I took physics and I wasn't understanding things. And my case manager was pushing me the last three years to really start advocating for myself. So I tried to advocate for myself. I went into my teacher's classroom and I said, you know, hey, I'm not really understand. I said this before class one or before school started even. Like, I'm not really understanding what's going on in class. If I come in before school every day, will you help me? And he looked at me and he said, well, do you have a specific question? And I said, well, I'm really not understanding any of it. And he said, well, I'm not going to reteach you everything. You can leave my class now. And he refused to help me. So my, and I was looking at it like, okay, I'm finally advocating for myself, but if I fail this class, it will take away all, not just one of my goals, but all of them. So my case manager went and talked to him and he eventually was like, well, I guess she can redo the work and see if it gets her up to that level of passing, or I guess I could give her a pass. I'm like, well, nobody taught me the first time, you know? If I tried to do it again, it would just be setting myself up to fail. So I took that pass and I took an agriculture science for my last science credit so that I could graduate. And I did graduate with all of those um, goals completed. I graduated on time with my class. I completed all of the same things that my classmates had to complete and I graduated with lowest honors. Well, congratulations to you on meeting <laughs> that goal um, and not giving up even when people in your life were not uh, supportive in the way that they could have been if they just opened themselves up and were a little more compassionate and understanding because not everyone starts at the same place. Not everybody comes in with the same life experience, the same understanding. Everybody starts from a different place and just being persistent when they couldn't uh, help you get to the goal that you wanted to accomplish or they showed some resistance to doing a little bit more to help you uh, get to your goal. Um, but not giving up is, is a key and important feature in that. And I'm imagining that's just a feature in who you are as a person, just someone who accident or not, you are a hard worker, you're resilient, you're uh, determined. And those aspects of who you are shined and showed up when it mattered the most. Um, Dr. Z, there was a, there were a couple of things that I wanted to touch on that that Ellen has mentioned. One of those, of course, when she talked about that experience on the bus, sometimes when people do really nasty, awful things to others, sometimes I what I think of when I see those things happen, I think those people are really small on the inside when they have to to go that low and take someone who is already going through something and make them feel worse. That's a reflection not of it. It's like this person needs to feel better than someone else who's already dealing with something. So instead of dealing with their own insecurities on the inside, they're trying to take this moment to to create more hardship for someone else that's already going through something. And in the end, it doesn't make them look better. It makes them look way worse. Right. Right. <laughs> right. That did by them doing that to you, it did show how little they felt about themselves. You know, there are some people that, you know, it's not even, sometimes they say kicking people while they're down. But the thing is, if they felt the need to do that, they already felt below you. 
like they already, you know, maybe they didn't like the attention that you were getting. Maybe they, you know, were just trying to get a laugh or a rise out of people. Regardless of why they were doing that, the fact that they did it and carried it through and, and called themselves laughing about it, it really did show more about them than it did about you. Because you still, like he said, you still persevered, you know, and them, you know, I wonder where all of them are today. I, you know, I always say that. It's like, what are you doing with your life? Like, do you do you love yourself yet? Because by demonstrating what they did to you, they clearly didn't love themselves or they clearly weren't confident in themselves because you wouldn't bully, bully and ridicule anybody that was in that condition. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And then the other piece of, of what Ellen mentioned, and I think we've all probably encountered this in some shape, form, or fashion just in life, where if you don't understand something and you go to someone who has the key to unlock all that information that you need, and instead of just, I don't want to be, like, instead of just saying, hey, I'll take that five minutes or that 10 minutes or that half an hour because I know that you have in you the potential to get it. They're just like, I don't want to be bothered. It's not worth my time. Right. And sometimes it feels as though people, they kind of get into the rut or the routine of life and what they're, they're doing in their own life where they lose that sense of compassion, that sense of empathy, that sense of humanity at a time where it could really be beneficial and make a real impact, especially if you're looking at the relationship between a teacher and a student. And I mean, I would imagine for some teachers, it's the most rewarding thing in the world when you see your student just get it and see that light bulb go off and, and they understand something that you've been trying so hard for them to get. But then there's also the other side of it where maybe you're just stuck in the rut. You've been doing the same job for years and it's just I'm going through the motions, not I'm connecting with students and still loving and enjoying and embracing the passion of what I do every day. Right, Dr. Right. Z? Right. You, you you ran into some not nice people. That's not the word that I really would use. But. <laughs> you know, we're live, so I won't curse. But you didn't, you didn't run into people that had your best interest at heart. And you know that you didn't. And like what you can do now is like just hope and pray that they have learned something by interacting with you. That you know what? Even though she had this happen to her, she still did well. That one teacher, even though I didn't help her, he just kind of brushed it off. Like at that point, you should have had accommodations. Even though you wanted to be in honors classes, yes, you can be in honors classes, but you deserved to have appropriate accommodations. Whereas if you had an additional question for clarity, if you asked for additional assistance, you should have received that. But what I did hear you say is you still went back to your caseworker and you told them what happened. You asked me to advocate for myself and here is what happened. And they followed up. Your caseworker did exactly what an adult should have done. They followed up with the person because as a person working with people, we want you to advocate for yourself. Right. But in the event that you don't get a positive result and in that instance you didn't, your caseworker went and followed up and that person was the adult out of the entire situation. That person did exactly what should have happened, which was, you know what? This is not right. I'm going to go to the teacher myself. That person is an awesome person. So I hope they're doing well. <laughs> He's amazing. He actually is the dean of students now. Oh, that's wonderful. Nice. Yeah. <laughs> and I wanted Me to add- measure, um, one, measure one positive from high school. Yes. So my senior year was in college psych and I was still, you know, being bullied and everything and people can understand. So it got to the point where in our college psych class, we were talking about the brain. So I went to my hospital and purchased a printout of a CT scan of my brain. One of the early ones that showed the injury very well. And I brought it into class and I got up in front of my class and I said, okay, open your textbooks to this page. And they did. And I'm like, okay, so on that page, you see a CAT scan of a normal brain. 
Then I put my brain CAT scan on the overhead projector. I'm like, this is my brain. And then I point it out to them everywhere. I'm like, you see these shaded areas? Those are the bruises on my brain that will not heal, really. Like, from what I understand still, there's no way of knowing if it'll ever heal. Like, and for the first time ever, one, just one student, one of my classmates, stayed after class and wanted to know more. And that teacher, he still uses my CAT scan to this day in class. He blacked out my name. I told him he didn't have to, but he blacked out my name. <laughs> <laughs> and I want to add, um, Ellen, just even though we've talked a lot so far about the challenges of navigating the people who weren't there, your family, you had your family, they were supportive and a small group of close friends were there when you really needed someone the most. And it's because of that support, you've been able to beat the odds, becoming a college graduate, you're now a wife, a cool aunt, and so many more things. <laughs> When you look at your journey, when you look back, and you're telling me you're coming up on 20 years this year, is that yeah. right? Since your injury, how do you feel when you when you look back at everything you've overcome to be in this moment, to have accomplished everything that you have? What do you feel? Thankful. I feel very thankful because I know that I wouldn't have made it as far as I have if I didn't have the support system that I do. They would say differently, so they always do when I say that. But my sister, she's my best friend, always will be, and she she is my she was my savior going back to school. Um my best friend who he became my best friend the year after my injury, and he's still my best friend a year younger than me. Jordan is amazing. He pushes me. He supports me in any way I need. My parents, my mom especially, she worked in special education for 30-plus years, so she knew what was going on, and she really pushed to make sure that I got the accommodations that I needed and that everything was being done according to laws and all of that. And she, she knew that if there wasn't people behind me pushing me that I could fall through the cracks and she wasn't going to let that happen. And my dad, I've always been a daddy's girl. <laughs> I was the girl growing up that when I fell and scraped my knee, I called for daddy. I didn't call for mommy. I mean, I'm very close to both of my parents, but I'm a daddy's girl. <laughs> and he, he was the one that whenever I was crying, he would comfort me and make me feel better. I started this conversation today. Uh, well, actually, before we started, I played a video and I talked a little bit about um, how I always remember the people who took the extra time to be there, to be supportive, yeah. to help, to answer that question where they didn't have to, to be there when they needed. One of the things that I know about you that, that you've shared is that now that you've been through everything that you have, you're now hoping to be that person that is supportive and there for others in the way that some of the people that uh, you navigated at school and other spaces weren't there for you. You're trying to be there for others in the way that they need someone. And, and that's really valuable and important, right? Absolutely. I mean, not everyone has the huge support system that I do. I mean, I am from a very big family, lots of aunts, uncles, cousins who are all still standing behind me. Right now, actually, I think at least four or five of them are watching. <laughs> they told me they would anyway. <laughs> um, Thanks for that. So <laughs> I know that not everybody has that big supportive family. And I want to be that support for the people that don't have it. And so I'll do what I can, whether it's donating through Birdies for Brains or my speaking engagements with the Brain Injury Alliance or 
I, when I was working as a cashier at Cub Foods, I worked in the floral department over Valentine's Day. And a lady came through and she's talking about how great it smells and how much I love, I must love it. I'm like, well, actually, I can't smell. And, you know, told her, and she asked why, and I told her. And she's like, oh, well, my daughter, she actually just uh, was hit by a car and she lost her sense of smell, but she just got it back. Mm-hmm. And then her daughter comes over and she introduced me. I'm like, here's my phone number. If you ever need someone to talk to, I'm always here. And I've done that multiple times. Just I want to make sure that people know that there's other people there they can talk to. And that's so incredible. And and Dr. Z, sometimes it seems like some of the most compassionate, the most caring, the most um, sincere, honest friendships come from people who have been through a lot and they've had to be there like and be in pain for a while and sustain that space. Those are the ones that really know how to navigate that and can be really incredible friends. Right, right. So not everybody is brought up to uh, knowing about compassion or knowing about being nurturing. It's sometimes people are born with it, but sometimes it's, you know, taught, you know, it's taught in the household. So the people that didn't treat you kindly, they're probably those people that don't, they don't know how to deal with people that are different. They don't know how to be compassionate. They don't know how to be empathetic, but you stated that you did meet some people after the fact. Um, I think you said his name was Jordan. One person's name was Jordan. Mm-hmm. Um, your sister totally demonstrated that she understood, you know, or that she could be compassionate and have empathy. Um, and then you, in turn, when you started to run into people that that had similar experiences or experienced other trauma, you, in turn, began to be compassionate towards them. And not everybody has that, right? Not everybody is able to do that. Not everybody is capable of doing that. Um, so when you start to experience people that are you know what you need at the time that you need them to be that those are your people those are the people that you stick by so it's cool to see that you know you have reached out to others and that you have a long life a lifelong friend in jordan and I want to say we've got about 20 minutes left. So if you're watching, if you would like to make a comment of any kind, I will be able to pop those up on the screen. If you have any questions for Ellen, questions for me, questions for Dr. Z, uh, hopefully we can get those answered for you here in the next 20 minutes. If you have a word of encouragement or if we've said anything that resonates with you today, be sure to share those comments and we'll get those uh, up on the screen. I have Rob here just saying hello. Hi, Rob Williams. And then we have Brandy from Tampa. Thanks for sharing. Thank you so much, Brandy, for commenting as well. If you're just joining us at all, we are talking today with Ellen Lagoon Waters and Dr. Zakia Robbins McNeil. Ellen is telling about her, telling us about her experience uh, as a survivor of a traumatic brain injury. And even though Uh, She had this injury almost 20 years ago. She has been persistent, determined, and conquered the goals that she set for herself. And with the dedicated support network around her of her family and some very close friends, now 20 years later, she is looking back at where and how all of that determination, that resilience Uh, paid off in a major way. She's now a college graduate. She's now a loving wife, the cool aunt, and many more things. And most importantly, she is that person that is there for so many others when they need a friend and someone to support them when they're going through something in a way that she didn't always have in some of the folks that she hoped to find it after her injury. Um, So I'm so appreciative of you today, Ellen, taking your time to share your story, your experience with us, Um, because I know there are pieces of your story that even though they may have happened 20 years ago, they still feel very real, very present, and very much um, um, things that cause you pain even today. So I'm appreciative of you just taking the time to share your journey with us. And hopefully, 
Um, others who are out there, um, whether you've had a traumatic brain injury or, or not, trauma in whatever form it's in, it can impact how we show up in the world. It can impact how other people respond to us in the world. And sometimes people go in to navigate and deal with that pain and in that isolation, they struggle to show up as their best self. They struggle to show up at all. And you kind of have to re, re figure out, refine yourself in the trauma, in the pain to get to a place where you can even share your story as Ellen is sharing with us today. But I think it's so important that we give ourselves grace and time because sometimes we want to be able to do everything all at once and, and snap our fingers and be, um, you know, in the perfect place. But sometimes you have to go through the process and the pain to, to finally get to that other side, process everything you went through, and then be in a place where you can share it. Would you say, Dr. Z? Yes, indeed. <laughs> you know, like, you never know why you end up on a certain place in, a, in your journey. You never know why your journey takes you through something like so traumatic as what you experienced. But even though you had that traumatic uh, event occur, you made it out and you were able to persevere. That in itself is resilient. And I know, I, you know, you know, some people will say like, oh, you're so strong, you're so strong. And I know that's kind of hard to hear sometimes, but it's like, even though you experienced that, you made it in spite of, you made it in spite of that traumatic brain injury. You made it in spite of, what did you say? You had, you lost your sense of smell. You made it in spite of losing some of your closest friends at the time. Um, you made it in spite of, you know, like, <laughs> I mean, well, this was a good thing. You had your sister that was standing up for you. Your sister was not having any of that nonsense happening with you. So I, I don't know if is, is that your sister that you are the closest to, you know, did the, did the accident create a tighter bond? Absolutely. Your sister? Um, because sometimes that happens as well. You know, now you have a, a lifelong protector. <laughs> In your sister that is like, you're not going to mess with her. <laughs> <laughs> She's actually trusting me right now, too. I am nannying for her firstborn, her son. Oh, that's awesome. <laughs> well, you guys are looking after each other. Right. <laughs> it's perfect. Right. <laughs> yes. And um, Ellen, is there anything that you would like to add um, as, as far as Coming through the experiences that you've lived through, what would you say, if you could say anything to the folks that we discussed when we began this conversation, the people that, um, you know, weren't supportive when you needed them to be, moved away when you needed them closer, the girl on the, the bus that um, blindfolded you. If you could say anything to those people coming from the place of understanding, um, and life experience that you have now, what would you want those people to know? I forgive them. I, I don't hold anything against anybody. And I hope that everybody is doing extremely well in their lives as well. And forgiveness can take time. Um, did you say it was college when you kind of came to that space? So roughly how many years was that? Like three, four, five years afterwards? Um, following my injury, then it would have been five or six years when I five started okay. my forgiveness process. Mm-hmm. And what, where, where did you, I mean, did something in the, the journey say, I need to let this go? Or how did you find yourself getting to that place of forgiveness? I think it was mostly just being in a new environment and meeting new people, but being so held back by my own depression, my own thoughts of what these people have done to me and that that was holding me back and not letting me be the person that I wanted to be 
So just being able to forgive and let that go helped me to really embrace myself and my new relationships, my new friendships, and my future. <laughs> so even though years had passed, you were still holding on to that pain and it still had power over your life and affected how you showed up in the world and the kinds of relationships that you had with the people around you. I'm not going to lie. It does still affect me occasionally, mm -hmm. but nowhere near to the extent as it used to. Mm -hmm. And Dr. Z, um, can you talk a little bit about that? Just sometimes just the act of letting go, it really is like giving yourself permission to live. Yep. Yeah. Holding on to anger is like holding on to like a dead weight. It's like trying to trying to carry. You have your physical being right here, and then you have your I'll say metaphysical being back here that is like carrying a ton of bricks that is equal to the size of yourself. You're trying to carry the dead weight, holding on to all of that anger. And when you're holding on to anger, or I'll just say when you do not practice the art of forgiveness, you're only holding yourself back. Um, you know, many, many people have stated that forgiveness is for yourself. And it is because if you are continuing to hold on to anger, you're only holding yourself back. The people that you're angry with probably don't even know like what's going on in your life. They probably don't even, I don't even want to, you know, they probably don't even know you exist, but here you are holding on to it as opposed to letting it go. Forgiveness doesn't mean that you forget what happened, but you're giving yourself the freedom. You're giving yourself the grace. You're giving yourself the opportunity to be better, right? Because if you're holding on to a dead weight, how can you propel yourself forward if you're holding on to something that's so heavy? It's too heavy to hold on to anger. Forgiveness really is the way. And it's the easiest way. It's the path of least resistance to get where you're really trying to be in the future. Thank you so much, Dr. Z. Uh, we have a comment here from Brandy. Brandy Shea says, resigned from a job yesterday after six years working with intellectual disabled adults. Past few months were challenging and played a role in my decision. Not a physical trauma like Ellen, but it's been difficult. Glad I ran across this live. Thank you so much for sharing that. Uh, Brandy, and thank you for sharing a, a piece of your journey with us. Um, I wanted to have this conversation because I feel like it's one that people navigate in different ways just throughout life, because sometimes in life you go through something that's really heavy that people that are around you that you hope would understand or would be there, they're not in your life in the way that you feel like you need them in your life and like running to try to get them isn't bringing them closer. Sometimes they move further away. And as Dr. Z has explained, you don't know, we don't always know what someone else's lived experiences might be that cause them to move away when we need them closer. Um, and so whether you're dealing with um, a brain injury, as was Ellen's case, or whether you're dealing with trauma of some other kind, maybe you um, lost a lot of weight, or maybe you were really a lot larger than you you are now at some point, and you lived your life differently, and now you've lost weight, and people are treating you differently. And you're like, wait, why are you you treating me like this? I was the same person. I just am a different size. Like, why why is the relationship changing? And and learning how to navigate the changes in the space, but knowing also that sometimes people around us may change, but. Um, just because they change, it doesn't mean that there's something wrong with the person that we are. It's just sometimes it's them. Right, Dr. Z? Right, right. And sometimes they don't know what to do. Mm -hmm. So it's really it's not even it's, it's really offering them grace as well, because they might not know how to handle it. They might not be capable of handling the change that occurred to you. And that's actually OK. It's okay that they don't understand how to deal with it. They can't be that person because they don't know to be that person. So you can't fault 
someone for being what they don't know how to be. So you would hope that it would come out in verbal communication, but sometimes it doesn't. We just have to be okay with, okay, this is, this is the new way it is. You know, you can try to fight with it. You know, sometimes the universe moves people out of the way in a way that we wouldn't have normally did it if this event did not happen. Sometimes people do need to go away. Sometimes it's a shift and change that needs to happen. And we just have to learn to be okay with the shift and change. Because as we are learning, growing, evolving, that event happening to, and we're talking to you now, that event happening to you probably changed the trajectory of somebody's life too, but we would never know. You know, everybody is impacted differently by life's events, whether they happen to you or around you. And Dr. Z, I guess we're we're talking about this on the other side of the experience, but how important is it for people when you're going through things to allow yourself to feel what you feel, like to feel the anger, to feel the frustration, to feel um, the anxiety, to feel all those things that you feel until you get to the place of forgiveness, but to allow yourself to acknowledge that those are real and to work through them. How important is that for people to do? It's very important. That's how you actually get to forgiveness. If you don't go through the process, whether it's a grief process, whether it's an anger process, whether it's a denial process, whether it is a, a process of accepting, you know, you have to go through certain phases in order to get to the other side. But many people don't understand. Sometimes it is easy to just be angry and then you're stuck in that anger. But if you get stuck in anger, how can you get to forgiveness? If you're holding on to that anger or if you're holding on to that denial, you're stagnating your own growth. However, people don't know what they don't know. Right. Some everybody doesn't know. Like, OK, I have to feel this. It's OK to cry. Many of us are taught it's OK. not Like we're not supposed to cry. So, OK, wait, now I can cry. OK, wait, what am I supposed to do? People don't know what to do. Sometimes you do have to get to a trusted professional to kind of help walk you through this process or a trusted friend. Um, and in your instance, you did have some people that can that helped you through that. You found that through writing for you. You know, you went through you probably went through the anger process and the denial process and the feeling of rejection process and the acceptance process. But you did it through writing. So for other people, it could be something different. For other people, it could be actual spoken word. For some people, it could be meditation. For some people, it could be verbalizing. We never know, you know how a person will get through or how they will process their feelings. But the goal is to actually process your feelings so that you can find your way to leaving that dead weight behind you. And Ellen, did you want to add to that? Yes. <laughs> um, most of my therapeutic tendencies is in writing, but being able to speak with the Brain Injury Alliance really helped me with that, too. I've been speaking with them since my freshman year of college, so 2005. Not quite as often lately, but I still try and do as much as so I'm speaking with the um, Minnesota Department of Revenue in September. So that'll be fun. Um, but I also really want to stress that my forgiveness is still ongoing. And my support system is still increasing. So it's not like my family has always been there for me. Jordan has been there for me since the beginning. But... My husband has only been here for the last 15 years. We've been together for 15 years, married for eight. Mm -hmm. But he he really pushes me to keep up with my writing and keeps telling me, like, she's like why don't you get yourself published? I'm like, it's easier said than done. <laughs> but he really pushes me to my goals, too. And I'm very thankful for that. And a couple of things I want to add on top of what you said, um, and Dr. Z to, to um, finish this out here, 
forgiveness can take time. It's not like, okay, I have to forgive somebody by this date or by this time or by this year. The process for everyone is going to be different. And you've got to allow yourself to go through whatever that process is for you to get to that space. And then on top of that, um, and, and Ellen, you might want to add on to this too after Dr. Z, do you find as you embrace all the pieces of who you are, the, except all the pieces of your story, um, that your circle begins to grow because you're like becoming more of who you are and you're sharing more of who you are with those around you? And as more people get a chance to experience and know the person that you are, you're like giving your real you out to the world. And in turn, you're welcoming in all of these pieces that are growing and expanding the circle that you have. And it just keeps getting bigger and bigger and bigger because the more that you share of who you are, the more the people that are in your life or should be in your right life for the right reasons are finding you. Um, sort of like, uh, I guess, as Dr. Z would say, the law of attraction there. Right. <laughs> right. Walking in your authentic self. Sometimes yeah. the process of freeing yourself allows the people that are supposed to be in your life get in. You start to attract those people because you are free. And the thing is, some people are supposed to be on different parts of the journey. Some people are, you know, your husband, you met your husband after your injury and you probably met him when you needed to meet him. But he's still helping you in your uh, forgiveness process. And again, it's a process. It's not a rule book, guidebook, standard. This takes three months, this takes three months, this takes three months. It doesn't matter how long it takes, just that you're moving. Even if sometimes, you know, you may move, you know, 0% one day, but you move 2% the next day. As long as you're, you know, working at it, as long as you're working at it, some days will be better than not. Forgiveness is a process. Sometimes it is a lifelong process, but you're demonstrating that you've been able to make great progress towards your forgiveness journey. And for that, I commend you. Thank you. And Ellen, would you like the last word there? What was the question again? I, oh, I was just saying, that's okay. I was just saying, um, as as um, you have found the the courage to share more of your story and your journey with others, do you feel that um, what was once a smaller circle of, of just your family and and a few very close friends is getting bigger? just because you're finding more courage to share more of who you are, more of your story, more of your journey with those around you? Absolutely. Although I feel like I go back and forth on whether I'm going into myself and hiding or letting myself be myself to everybody. Um, but I'm trying to do better with that. <laughs> And it's a and it's a process. And I I'm very thankful that you are willing to join me today in this space to share your journey with all of us. Um, everybody's going through something, and even if they don't comment there, I'm I'm expecting text messages afterwards of people that your story resonated with, and they maybe didn't have the courage to post on the screen here. And that's okay. Everybody's in a different place of comfort, but the idea is to create space for others to feel comfortable sharing pieces of who they are and the hopes that at the end of the day, we can all help move each other forward in a positive and meaningful way. So I'm very thankful that you are willing to share this space with me, Dr. Z. Always wonderful to have you back. Before we go, I want to let everybody know about um, a few things that are coming up uh, for Let's Chat. Coming up next week, we're going to be talking about divorce and co-parenting. We'll have Alicia Price and Liz Steen joining us. The conversation is about trying to keep relationships out of the court, trying to navigate divorce and co-parenting outside of the court system, giving you some tips, tools, techniques to navigate that process. Then on September the 3rd, we're going to be talking about changing careers, feeling the fear, and doing it anyway. The last year has come with a lot of changes and challenges for people. Some either lost jobs or lost hours. Maybe they found themselves looking at a completely different career field that they never intended before. We're going to hear some of those stories from folks that are career changers, some during the pandemic, others prior to. 
they're going to share how their lives have changed tremendously just by taking that little leap that plunge in some cases and, and doing something different. Then on September the 10th, we're going to be talking about the cost of personal growth. It's kind of similar to the conversation we had today, but that idea of wanting to move forward professionally in your own life or in your own career, and you have those folks around you that are like, hey, I'm moving on to this other thing. I want you to be there. I want you to be supportive. And for some reason, they can't be there for you as you make that professional transition to a new space. And there's kind of a grieving process sometimes with that, where you're you're hoping that folks would be in your life in one way, then they're not able to stay in your life in the way that you want them. How do you navigate those changes in those relationships and still move forward and accomplish the things that you hope to do? Then the last one I'll tell you about, creating space for conversation coming up on September the 17th. We'll be talking about folks who are doing things like I'm doing here, creating space for conversation. They're using their platforms, creating platforms where people can come together, grow, learn about each other, and um, expand their circles in a meaningful and positive way. So we're going to have some conversations with some dynamic people coming up in the next few weeks. And I really hope that uh, you all will join us for more Let's Chat. Before we go, Diane Grady uh, shared, Ellen, thank you for sharing your remarkable story. Thank you, Dr. Z, for all of your helpful advice. Thank you, Diane, as well, for tuning in. And Dr. Z and Ellen, if you can just stay with me for a, a few more minutes, I'm going to go ahead and wrap up the chat, and then we'll talk quickly um, behind stage here in just a second. Have a good evening, everybody.